Thank you very much, David. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me to come and talk to the WFA this evening. And for those who are taking part, um, just a little bit about me before I start. I'm a museum consultant. I specialize in um, military heritage. Um, I make funding applications on behalf of universities, museums, libraries, and archives. And within that exhibition design, I specialize in heritage relating, relating to the civil wars in this country. And of course, as tonight, the First World War. I've worked for the Soldiers of Oxfordshire Museum, Alcott Woodstock, the University of Oxford, Banbury Museum, and I've written a couple of books, the last of which is the subject of tonight's talk, which is The Flying Sikh, Hardit Singh Malik, and the First World War. In April 1917, a young recently recruited, beturbaned Sikh Royal Flying Corps cadet was spotted by the Sergeant Major on the parade ground at Aldershot. He was the archetypal NCO, red face, bull neck, big moustache, commanding voice. Why aren't you in uniform? I am. I don't understand, replied the Sikh. What do you mean? Where is your at? I must wear a turban. The Sergeant Major was having none of it. The young man's name was Hardit Singh Malik, a British subject from Ralpindi in what was then a United India, but of course is today in Northern Pakistan. He was just 23 years old. Fortunately, an adjutant noticed Malik's predicament. The matter was referred to the commanding officer on the base, and eventually special dispensation was granted for the turban to be worn by the war office. But David said, I'm, I'm going to talk for about 45, 50 minutes, no more than that. Uh, I'm going to let people talk for themselves, particularly Hardit Singh. The talk is arranged chronologically, and it's mainly about his war service, which defined the rest of his life. But why should we be interested in this man? Well, first of all, he's a charming, charismatic, talented man who faces many challenges in his life, all of which he manages to overcome. By doing so, we get an alternative view of the First World War. We're going to, for the most part, leave the trenches and go up into the air. We're going to Italy. We're going to India. It gives us a view of empire, very importantly, insights into the embryonic Royal Flying Corps and the RAF, and an understanding of the politics of the time, sometimes which are forgotten. I've known um, about Malik's story for many years. I included him in uh, a number of exhibitions that I designed during the First World War centenary. One of them is illustrated here. Malik became one of the poster boys for the Royal British Legion. His story has been taken up by children's authors. He's featured his, in documentaries and on stamps, both in South Asia and here. And he's a reminder that one and a half million Indians fought on behalf of the empire during the First World War. It's true to say, though, that although he was a representative of India's wartime contribution, he was definitely not typical of the average Indian sepoy. The presentation is mainly biographical. In fact, the first half of the talk is going to be about Malik himself and his formative years. And the second half will look at his involvement in some depth during the Great War. 
At that time, I'm going to touch on a political theme very briefly. And that was about a debate that was taking place in the corridors of power, which, although he never knew it, Malik was a part. And that debate was about Indians taking officer commissions in Britain's armed forces during the First World War with the same status as British officers. And that debate will be between the India office, the war office, the government of India in Delhi, and the air ministry. We got in the photographs here on the left is Edwin Montague, Secretary of State for India during the second half of the Great War. And on the right, Lord Chelmsford, the Viceroy of India. And during 1918 and into 1919, the two of them exchanged telegrams which name checked Malik personally. How is it? that a lone Sikh Indian pilot had come to the attention of the Viceroy and the Secretary of State. More of that later. In 1908, Malik traveled alone from Rawalpindi to Bombay. He took a ship to Marseille, a train to Calais, and finally a bus to school in Notting Hill Gate. He was 14 years old. He made the travel arrangements himself, his father's condition for doing so, passports not needed before the First World War, of course. He'd been privately educated at home for English, literature and mathematics, and had a love of sports. He was as well prepared as any person from abroad could be of participating in the British education system, the public school and the Oxbridge sectors. Eventually he made his way to Eastbourne College on the south coast. Here he is in this slide on the right hand side, uh, part of the first 11 cricket team. He says in his memoir that he was bullied only on the first night when a gang of boys attempted to remove his turban. And he told them that although he was outnumbered and wouldn't be able to stop them, the first one who did remove it, he would kill sometime, somehow, somewhere. The boys backed off, word got round, and he had no further trouble public school boys also knowing that Sikhs carried the ceremonial dagger of their faith, the kirpan, about their person. He joined the officer training corps at Eastbourne, and of course, like any teenager, got into all sorts of scrapes. On one particular occasion with friends driving bicycles dangerously along the seafront to Eastbourne to impress some local girls, Malik knocked down a policeman and rode off. And as there weren't too many turbans in Eastbourne, he was tracked down, gated, and fined. He excelled at cricket at Eastbourne. He caught the batting averages in 1912, and while doing so, was spotted by a friend of this chap. This is, of course, the great Ramji Sinji, the Sussex and England batsman. And through that connection, Malik will be asked to play for Sussex and features in the county championship of 1914 and 1921 with complete wisdom records. You might be interested to know that um, during my research of the book, I discovered that Eastbourne College played a local team called the Sussex Martlets, and that Malik was out on many occasions to the subtle offspin of the Martlets captain, one Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. But Malik is not just talented on the sports field, he's also an academic. 
He entered Balliol, Oxford in the autumn of 1912, another fresher with Harold Macmillan, the future prime minister. In the refectory, Macmillan asked H.S. Malik that first night at Balliol which school he had attended. And when told Eastbourne, Macmillan replied superciliously, Eastbourne, Eastbourne, where is that? H.S. retorted by asking Macmillan to which school he attended. And when the future PM replied, Eaton, Malik replied, never heard of it. And no serious long-term relationship followed, which as we'll see was unusual. On a serious note, Super Mac was assessing HS's financial and social status. It how public school boys assessed each other's wealth and social capital then, and of course, now. And the photograph on the left shows Macmillan in uniform during the First World War. He was to be very severely wounded in 1916 on the Somme in September. Balliol has long associations with India. Three consecutive viceroys, Lansdowne, Elgin and Curzon at the end of the Victorian period were all Balliol men. I'd like to introduce to you the chap who's sitting down on the right-hand photograph. This is Francis F. Urquhart, Malik's tutor. A very well-known man at Oxford, before, during, and after the First World War, known to everyone as Sligger. Please don't ask me why, no one knows. Sligger persuaded Malik to take modern history, he believed that that would be better for his student to gain entry into the Indian civil service, which was Malik's ambition at this moment. You might be interested to know that Sligger also tutored, in addition to Macmillan, Evelyn Waugh, Cyril Connolly, Anthony Powell, Harold Nicholson, Quintin Hogg, and he was also allegedly the model or Mr. Sam Grass, if you know your bride's head, revisited. In the photograph on the left, this is Malik in his first year at Balliol, and I was interested to note that he had still got his Eastbourne blazer on. A little bit more about cricket. As I mentioned, he played in the county championship in 1914 and 1921 scored a century against Leicestershire and was playing against Kent on the 4th of August, 1914, during Canterbury Week. And in the Sussex County Cricket Archive at Hove, I was delighted to be shown the photograph that's on the right. Here's Malik at cover point. Um, the only photograph taken with him featuring in the field. he's academic, he um, is well educated, he's academic, and if that's not sufficient, in the two years before he goes up to Oxford, he teaches himself to play golf and becomes very talented at a game that he will be playing into old age. During the 1920s and 1930s, Hadit Singh Malik will become India's greatest player, and he will feature against such players as Edward VIII, Eisenhower, Ben Hogan, Bobby Jones, and actually the list is endless. But let's get back now to the First World War. When war broke out, many young Indian students rushed to volunteer. There were about 2,000 in Britain at this time. Many were rejected as potential, quote, nationalist revolutionaries. On a personal note, 
um, Malik was unable to be recruited at the at the office three times. The best that he could be offered was as an orderly at Brighton, caring, of course, for those India Corps casualties. But Malik wanted to actively support the war effort. His colleagues and peers from Balliol had all left to go to war. And in des some desperation, he approached the Dean of Balliol, Sligar Urquhart, the latter of whom was able to enable him to join the French Red Cross. The reason for that is that Sligar Urquhart was on the management board of the Red Cross in Britain. And during the time of the German assault at Verdun, there was a huge outcry across Britain and a major fundraising effort. And one of the outcomes of that was the purchase of this ambulance that you can see in these lovely photographs on this slide. And Hardit Singh Malik was chosen as a Red Cross officer to take that ambulance down to Cognac to support the hospitals in and around the town in the west of France. And he drives the vehicle in April of 1916. I found these photographs in the archive of the Croix Rouge Francaise. Here's a front cover of the Manual of Military Law of 1914. So why was it difficult for Indians to join Britain's armed forces, even at the rank of private? This manual classed any person of colour as, quote, either an alien or a native who might be enlisted in special circumstances and limited numbers, but could not hold any rank in His Majesty's regular first forces above non-commissioned officer. And particularly in 1918 and into 1919, Malik's case was used to challenge that principle, particularly by officials at the India office and for a time, the Air Ministry. But Malik had, as many Oxbridge men did and do, friends in high places. For these chaps in your slides, this is Sligar Urquhart, the Dean of Balliol. In the center, David Henderson, the head of the Royal Flying Corps who took the body to France at the outset of the war in 1914. And on the right, the Secretary of State for India for the first half of the First World War, Austin Chamberlain. During his time down at Cognac, Malik spent much of um, the working day transporting casualties from the railway stations to some of the specialist hospitals in and around the town. But he'd been designated as an officer for the French Red Cross and as such was able to gain access to the officers' mess, mixing with French officers from all over the French empire. And that's a very important point because two things happen. Firstly, he becomes inspired by the story of the great French air ace, Georges Guinemer. And no doubt during the discussions in the mess, some of the French officers of the Militaire Aeronautique suggest to, Halleck, uh, to Malik that he might be enlisted into the French Flying Corps. And Malik writes back to Oxford and to Balliol, to Sligar Urquhart, and he says, I wrote to Sligar and he was furious and he complained about it to General David Henderson. And what you need to know is that both Sligar Urquhart on the left and David Henderson 
in the center were both part of the management committee of the French Red Cross. And that connection enables Hardit Singh Malik to gain an interview in Whitehall at the office of Sir David Henderson. So Malik is sent back at Henderson's request for that interview. I'd like to read to you an internal memo from the British Library. It's from Lord Islington, the Under Secretary of State at the India office, and he's writing to his boss, the then Secretary of State, Austin Chamberlain. And in that memo, Hardit Singh is mentioned personally. I should like to take this opportunity of mentioning to you the case of Mr. Malik, an Indian graduate of the University of Oxford and a golf blue, who recently applied to this office to help him into the French Flying Corps, where it is understood he would get a commission. The anomaly of our encouraging a British subject to enter the army of one of our allies when he was inadmissible for our own was so striking and would have led to so much misconception that I have brought the case personally to the notice of Sir David Henderson, who has arranged that the young man shall be given an honorary commission in the Royal Flying Corps. Even so, we are still faced with the difficulty that the honorary commission will carry no pay. And Mr. Malik, I understand, cannot afford to serve without pay. What Hardit Singh didn't realize at the time is that he was one of five Indian airmen who were going to be recruited into the RFC between November 1916 and March 1917. And the window for Indian pilot recruitment would then close and no further Indians would be recruited until the middle end of 1918. Why are those these five Indians recruited during this time? Let's look at a bit of the context of what's happening in the war. During the Battle of the Somme, Major General Hugh Trenchard, then head of the Royal Flying Corps, was essentially running short of pilots and observers. On the 21st of September, 1916, he writes to the chap on the bottom right, that's um, Sefton Branca, the director of air organization, who is responsible for recruitment into the Royal Flying Corps. He writes this, quote, it is not a question of difficulty of supplying pilots. It is a question as to whether it can be done or whether it can't be done. If we cannot do it, then we are beaten. And Trenchard made sure that that message got through to the Imperial War Cabinet also. And as a result of that shortage of British pilots and observers, those five Indians that you can see there, including Hardit Singh Malik on the right, were recruited as test cases, quote unquote, by Sefton Branca. More about him a little bit later. So how had Hardit Singh and the other pilots been accepted when their recruitment was in breach of military law? Everyone who knew Malik believed that he was officer and material, but no quote unquote, native could be an officer. Officials at the India office and the air ministry had looked for a loophole in the manual of military law and they found one. One official suggested that these Indians could be honorary officers in the way that, for example, our new king, Charles, was formerly 
um, Colonel in Chief of the Parachute Regiment, an honorary title. Another official at the Inder office pointed out that only until recently, the end of 1915, he was indicating, the German Kaiser was an admiral in the Royal Navy. It was also pointed out that the bearer of an honorary title does not exercise any actual power and that in a single seat plane, he wouldn't have to command anyone. And this was the issue at point that it wasn't possible for Indians to command British personnel. It was also cynically pointed out on another document that the life expectancy of a novel, novice pilot was only 10 days and perhaps the problem would not be around for too long. Nevertheless, rules were bent, the young Sikh was in and in March of 1917, he joined the Royal Flying Corps at South Farnborough with a temporary honorary commission. And he says, quote, I was allowed to keep my turban, but I had to wear an outside flying helmet. I had one made by a hatter in Piccadilly. And on these wonderful photographs, this is flight training on the Loire in France in 1917. The one on the right is particularly joyous to me. And um, what a wonderful image that is. Let's go more deeply now into the First World War. After training, Malik was posted to 28th Squadron in July 17, and that squadron was posted on the 8th of, on the 8th of October, Droglan, one of the easternmost um, um, positions in French Flanders, right up against the Belgian border. And of course, he would be fighting in the Third Battle of Ypres flying the newly introduced Sopwith Camel. It was one of the first squadrons, 28th Squadron, to receive that plane. In the campaign, he will serve under this chap, Captain William George Billy Barker, who was to become and remains Canada's most decorated soldier ever. Listen to this, MC and two bars, DSO and bar, VC. And Malik says of serving with Captain Barker, quote, most of us were young and inexperienced and many of us were shot down. I was lucky to be under the command of Captain Barker, a great fighter pilot. He looked after us novices. The battles were terrifying. The rattle of machine gun fire, the nauseating smell of oil, how you suddenly lost contact with the others and were all at once alone in the sky. You might be interested to know that during my research into 28 Squadron that I discovered that the atmosphere on the ground was toxic during the First World War. There was bad feeling um, between the Brits on the one hand and the Canadian pilots on the other. William Barker had been promoted over a a popular flight lieutenant. And it was also believed by many in the squadron that the, we are, the, the commanding officer was rather a weak individual. And Hardit Singh Malik would have needed all of his powers of diplomacy to manage those difficult relationships, I think. Barker was a very ambitious pilot in our First World War parlance, he we would say that he was a thruster wanting to attack the Germans at every opportunity. And upon discovering that Richthofen's Yaster 11 was based at Markabika, some 30 miles away, Barker instantly wanted to take on the Flying Circus. And on the 26th of October, he calls for volunteers from his flight and that includes Hardit Singh Malik. And here in the photograph, you can see him. Before mentioned, 
flying helmet, which fitted over his turban, he's holding it. He, um, I don't think, enjoyed being photographed with it. He didn't enjoy wearing it. And actually, later in the war in Italy, he, um, he actually abandoned it and just flew with the turban. Talking of the sortie against Richthofen on the 26th, he says this, quote, it was a most foolhardy operation and the CO actually forbade it. But Barker got the okay from Wing HQ. The Germans were crazy too. I should say that the weather was appalling on that day. Most flights were grounded. Malik continues, we found 20 of Richthofen squadron heading our way. There was a terrific fight and two of the four of us were shot down. I shot down one of the Germans and then Barker and I turned tail. There was a sharp smell of petrol and a pain in my leg. I crash landed behind our own lines and fainted. I should say that although um, Malik believed, as did Barker, that they were engaged with Yaster 11, with Richthofen. Um, the expert on this clash on that day over Passchendaele is Greg Van Wingarden, who some of you will know. And both Greg and I are sure that actually, rather than Yaster 11, um, 28 Squadron that day came up against um, Yaster 18, the Red Noses, and you can see one of those planes, which would have e easily been confused with the red um, fuselages of Yaster 11. Malik's plane, upon recovery, uh, it was a he crash landed at Zillabika, by the way, had 450 bullet holes in it. Two of them had gone into his leg and would stay there for the remainder of his life. He recuperated back in London for about six weeks and then rejoined his squadron at the end of the year in 1917. 28 Squadron in the meantime had been sent to the Italian front after the disaster at Caporetto that November. And Malik flew um, on the Isonzo in that campaign for about a month, but unfortunately then developed an, an acute allergic reaction to the castor oil, which lubricated the camel's rotary engine. There'd been some signs of it during the Passchendaele campaign. And Captain Barker was forced to send Harlit Singh Malik home back to Britain, something which Malik was not pleased about, to say the least. And so on the 27th of February 1918, he's posted to 141 Squadron at Biggin Hill, where he will protect London from the Gotter bomber strikes and occasionally giant bombers, of course. And here he will be flying Bristol fighters. I was delighted upon reading through the official history of Biggin Hill a couple of years ago to discover that Malik was name checked in that great tome. I'd just like to read that to you, please. Quote. A few days later, an additional pilot arrived. Lieutenant Hardit Singh Malik, a Sikh, Raoul Pindi. He turned up late one night, long after the orderlies had gone off duty, and was given an empty room in the requisition cottage. In the morning, the other officers were woken by piercing yells and dashed out of their rooms to see what was happening. A batman, entering the new arrival's home with shaving water, had been startled out of his wits by the turbaned and black bearded head on the pillow and fled before streams of Hindustani invective from the indignant Malik. A keen cricketer and golfer, Malik was one of the most popular officers at Biggin Hill. 
He staunchly refused to part with his turban and somehow managed to fit over it an outside flying helmet, earning the affectionate nickname of Flying Hobgoblin on the ground crew. And here are the members of 141 Squadron at Biggin Hill. Hardit Singh Malik, unmistakable at the back. And this teapot has been stolen by some members of the squadron the night before from the local tea shop roof. In March of 1918, at a rainy ceremony in Manchester, Hardit Singh accepted a new sop with camel on behalf of the Royal Flying Corps from the Manchester Chamber of Commerce. At that time, he was the most successful Indian pilot. Indra Ladi Roy would eventually get going and shoot down 10 Germans in July. But at that moment, that belonged to Hardit Singh, who received a medal for his activities. What was interesting about that ceremony is that it was very well photographed and was filmed. And the films were shown, and that film was shown not only in Britain, but also in India. It was intended to engage Indian audiences for a particular purpose, and we'll come to that in a moment. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be able to show you uh, a clip from that film, um, and you're going to be able to see Malik himself. He's one of the few soldiers I can think of, I'm sure many of you can think of others, who were filmed at the time and then filmed and interviewed in the 1980s. There aren't too many, though. This is in March of 1918. It's a 30-second clip. There we are. And there he is. One of the purposes of that film was to boost recruitment in India. I'm just going to talk a bit about what's happening in the First World War. It's something you'll all be familiar with, but it's just worth recapping so that Malik's story makes some sort of sense within it. In March of 1918, when it was made, the French, of course, had been quiescent in their, since their mutinies of May the previous year. Russians were out because of the revolution. The Americans were not yet in. And Britain was holding the line on the Western Front um, and taking on the senior role. But of course, we know in March, April, May and June that it became overstretched in France and Flanders and came close to defeat following the Kaiserschlacht. During that time, there, it became evident that Britain was suffering from manpower shortages and the Imperial War Cabinet, not only were they attempting to address those immediate shortages, but they were also starting to plan for the long term because from the viewpoint of March of 1918, the war looks as though it's going to continue into 1919, of course. And the War Office estimates that by the end of 1918, the BEF will be short by 256,000 men. Privately, Haig, Lord Haig estimates that the gap might be as high as 460, or we could say, well, he would, wouldn't he? But nevertheless, Britain is facing a manpower shortage. And 
during the debate in, in, of the Imperial War Cabinet during the summer of 1918, it's clear that they have decided that Indians, further Indian recruitment will fill that gap. And the number of another half a million Indians will need to be recruited if Britain is to continue the war into 1919. And Lloyd George himself knows that if that recruitment is to go ahead, then moderate Indian politicians will need to be engaged in South Asia. And that will mean giving them concessions. And one of the most important concessions, according to the Imperial War Cabinet, is giving Indians King's Commission status in Britain's armed forces with the same status as British officers. And as a result of all of this, initial schemes are put in place in the Indian Army and the RAF during the middle of 1918. So what's this got to do with Hardit Singh Malik? Well, now that Indian commissions are on the agenda, his temporary honorary commission as a second lieutenant is made into a full lieutenant and the honorary commission is removed. That takes place in August of 1918, backdated to the formation of the RAF on the 1st of April, 1918. And then of course, from the dark days of March, April and May of 1918, we know in the summer, in the late summer, that the German forces begin to collapse. And that October, Malik, who's been kicking his heels a bit with 141 Squadron, and then he does some tuition with 78 Squadron, is posted back to France with 11 Squadron, Albert Ball's old squadron. Malik wants to see some combat again before the end of the First World War. But before that end comes, he's beginning to prepare for demobilization. And here's Sefton Branker again, who was one of those instrumental here for his enlistment. And Branker is about to retire at the end of the First World War, and he makes a tour of squadrons in France and Flanders. And during that tour of squadrons, he goes to see Malik personally. And he asked Malik about his plans for the future. And Hardit Singh says that he wants to go home on leave, back to Britain, to Eastbourne, to Oxford, to tie up his affairs. And then he wants to return home to Ralpindi. And by the way, he's not been home since he was 14 and he's now coming up to 24. At the end of that meeting with Branca, he makes it clear that he wants to fly as a pilot officer in India with the RAF. And the war ends. And just before the war ends, those embryonic initiatives that I mentioned about giving Indians officer commissions are reneged upon by the government of India, who were party to them at their outset. Two key telegrams of November lay out the conditions. So Malik duly returns to Britain and then Punjab in February and March of 1919. And what he never knew at the end of his life was that there was great bureaucratic concern about a Sikh returning to India to join the RAF. If you just bear with me, I'm just going to give you three dates. The aforementioned Sefton Branca is about to retire from the RAF on the 12th of January. But on the 3rd of January, he writes for the third or fourth time, formally to the India office, recommending Hardit Singh Malik as a pilot officer in India. 
in spite of knowing that the, um, the bid to give officer commissions to Indians has been reneged upon. And after a flurry of, of um, telegrams between London and Delhi, on the 27th of March, the government of India from the Viceroy's office personally write furiously to the India office saying that, quote, somebody is still writing to the RAF in India recommending Malik as a pilot officer. And I'm pretty sure that that is, that somebody is Sefton Branker. And Malik, ho Malik returns home to Ralpindi at the beginning of March 1919. And he finds in Ralpindi and in Punjab in general that all is not well. There is a great deal of unrest caused by over recruitment um, and some poor recruitment practices which have been put in place. There's an outbreak of plague. Disgruntled sepoys are returning from all over the world, having fought a war for freedom and then finding that India is no closer to its own independence. The Chelmsford Montague reforms have been put in place. The Rowler Acts have been enforced. And it's not a, um, a stable place in which to arrive. Just to change the the tone of the story slightly. Upon his arrival back in Ralpindi, his parents have arranged a marriage for him. But here's a, here's a man who left as a boy and is returning as a combat pilot, and he's having none of it. But as a good son, he finds a way out. And it's fortunate that he fancies, if I can use a pejorative term, he fancies the arranged marriage um, lady's sister. And on the 13th of April, 1919, during the festival of Basaki, Hardit Singh Malik marries Prakesh in Rawalpindi. But on that same day, 150 miles away in Amritsar, that's the day on which the massacre will take place. A crowd fired on by Indian troops, British Indian troops, in the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. 600 people are killed and over a thousand injured. And what's often forgotten is that the next day the RAF are dropping bombs over villages in Dula, Bangwapura, etc., killing about a dozen. And there's now absolutely no way that a Sikh pilot can fly over the Punjab. Malik's own family didn't want him to do that either, nor I suspect did he himself. He did not want to be in a position where he was um, in combat with his um, fellow nationals, fellow Indian nationals. There we are. Coming to the end now. So here's um, Hardit Singh and uh, Prakash shortly after their marriage, and they were married for 60 years, by the way, had three children. You can see some of them on the right. And about four months having arrived back from Ralpindi, not able to join the RAF in India, Hardit Singh Malik makes the decision to return with Prakash back to Britain. And at when he embarks at Bombay again, he has every intention of joining or continuing with the RAF in Britain. That is why there's an urgency with him to return so promptly. 
And one of the challenges and frustrations of writing the book about about this chap was that when he arrived in Southampton at the end of August 1919 he'd actually changed his mind and I'd love to know what the triggers were for that change of mind because he was very passionate about continuing with the aria it's something I don't think we'll ever know so he returns to Britain in 1919 Carries out another year at the University of Oxford. It's a probationary year for the Indian Civil Service. And enjoys a long and distinguished career as a civil servant and diplomat, most notably as the first Indian High Commissioner to Canada and later the first Indian Ambassador to France after partition appointed by Nehru, who became a friend. I can't resist just telling you a little bit about the photograph in the middle. During 1919 and into 1920, the Maliks went on a, a tour of the UK. Um, Prakash, Malik's wife, had learned to play golf, and the two of them were a sensation on various golf courses around the UK. would be awarded in later life the OBE and the Légion d'honneur and he retired in 1957 moving to Delhi where he died in 1985 and here is his obituary on the left this is from the London Times he was playing golf until the end of his life um, there's a lovely interview in Hindi where he claims that the greatest achievement of his life was scoring 79 at the age of 79 in the Delhi Open. And his autobiography, A Little Work and a Little Play, was published posthumously in 2011 by his daughter. I'd just like to leave the last word with the Secretary of State for India, Edwin Montagu, who was writing on the 8th of December, 1921, when the issue of officer commissions was still a very active one. After the Jallian Walla Bagh massacre, it's my view that there was no turning back towards independence. It would be a slow, intractable process, but, Leveling up the officer commissions within the Indian Army, and in fact, all of Britain's armed forces, would be a key request from Delhi, from Indians. And this is the view of the Secretary of State for India, Edwin Montagu, on that December day. Quote, I am absolutely opposed to asking Indians to risk their lives in aeroplanes during the war and then after the war, refused to allow them to get commissions. I will never consent to agreeing with any government department which objects to putting Indians in command over British personnel. I cannot for the life of me understand why I am continually being asked by my colleagues in the government to assent to a proposal which violates every pledge and every understanding about racial discrimination that has been given in the name of His Majesty's government from Queen Victoria downwards. In the late 1920s, the Indian Sandhurst Committee established, was established to select the first Indian officers for the proposed Indian Air Force. Malik, who was the only surviving Indian who'd seen combat with the RAF during the First World War at that time, and he appeared before the committee and played a part in the decision to send six Indian officer cadets to England for pilot training in 1930 at RAF Cranwell. Included in their number would be the future chief of the air staff, Subroto Mukherjee. He was actually the nephew of Indra Ladi Roy, one of the five aforementioned Indian pilots. 
And finally, when he died in 1985, Hardit Singh Mallet had still the two bullets embedded in his leg on that dogfight over Passchendaele on the 26th of October, 1917. And it seemed appropriate somehow because he believed that that miraculous escape had had a profound effect on his life and convinced him that one dies only when one's time comes. A conviction which led to a kind of fearlessness, which I think gave him strength throughout his life in facing the crises which lay ahead. He did believe though, that his time in the Royal Flying Corps and the RAF had been the making of him. Thank you for listening. Stephen, thanks very much indeed. That was absolutely fascinating and uh, very interesting to uh, to listen to uh, uh, the the story of um, of uh, Malik and indeed um, the uh, the story of of his war service. So, in the best traditions, as as you may remember, everybody, now's the time for a round of applause. But uh, we can't do it uh, noisily, <laughs> so we do it via uh, raising of hands. So, if you press the if you enjoyed that, just press the raise hand button on the bottom of either Zoom, and I can confirm, Stephen, that, that, that there's hundreds of hands going up as a, a silent, but ne nevertheless heartfelt um, congratulations and well done for, for such a splendid talk. It, it's Q&A time now, so who's up first? It looks like it's Gordon's going to be joining us. Gordon. Stephen, that was smashing. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, my you. question is... Um, was the president not set by Walter Tull as the first person of colour to be uh, commissioned in, as an officer in the uh, in the British Armed First Forces? And why was that courtesy not extended to Malik? Um, I think in, you're absolutely right that the, um, Malik doesn't claim that he was um, was the first. In fact, he he was. Um, fourth of five of those Indians to be um, to be recruited. Um, I'm familiar with Walter Tull, but I forget the exact details of his recruitment. Um, what is undeniable is that the baseline was that manual of military law, and um, no matter, I'm not sure how Tull was recruited. I can't remember that. I think he nevertheless. Died. He joined yeah, he up. was. Say again. He joined up. He, he he was a professional footballer. Was tall. Yeah, that's and right. He, he was that people knew him, and he joined up, and eventually he became the he was the first commissioned. He actually died nineteen eighteen. I think he was killed in the Great War. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, all this to and froing between the um, the people in India saying he can he should he shouldn't he, is it not allowed. All that should have been, we would have thought, already established. When yeah, it, well, it, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's yeah, it certainly it certainly wasn't established. Um, yeah. I, I, you might be interested to know actually that in in my res research for this book, I actually came across about five or six other Indians who mm -hmm. found their way into the Middlesex Regiment, two of whom fought on the Somme. Now, yeah. where they all where they all fight. Um, where they're all recruited and at what point they enlist, I don't know. But mm. what they are all up against is is the, is the colour bar within that um, within the manual of military law. And what it says, and th this is what we'd need to be aware of with Pearl, is that in that section that I quoted to you, is that if you're a person of colour, you're either an alien or a native, and Thank you, you can yeah. join the armed forces but not as an officer. Now, what I suspect, and maybe someone on this um, on this video call might be able to help us out, is that actually um, Paul was recruited as an other rank and then yeah. worked his way up to officer. That might be it. But you certainly yeah, couldn't that, be recruited that's a, as an that's officer. A, that's a route. That's a route to 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 be an officer then. Yeah, that might be it. That would be interesting, actually, Gordon, for you and I to follow up. How, what was what was his route? Right. It's, it, it would not, because Malik was a Sikh, there was no no underlying thing about that. No, it was entirely to do with the fact that 
they were looking for test cases because yeah. of that pilot shortage and they let yeah. a number of them in. Other, other Indians, certainly Indians I can talk about, had definitely been recruited before Malik into the Indian Army yeah. because they fight. What two of them are fighting on the first day of the Somme with the 16th Middlesex. But I think the thing is, the, it's the officer class that, that's the... Uh, it is. The main thing, yes. OK, well, well, thank you very much for that. Excellent answer, and I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Thank oh, you. Well, thank you, Gordon. That's a really good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Gordon. Thanks. Um, right, ne next up, um, Edwin, do you want to just unmute yourself there? Hi, Stephen. Thank you very much for a really excellent talk. Really enjoyed thank it. Thank you, Edwin. Uh, just one. Was there... Do you know how many other Indians joined after the initial five and how many uh, yeah, have actually survived the, the conflict? Yeah, that's a really good question. In 1918, I think there's another seven that are recruited but don't get into the air in combat. They're undergoing training from about June of 1918 when those initial schemes are put in place. But they don't they don't feature in combat. Okay, thank you very much, Grip. Thank you. And again, thank you very much for the talk. No, well, thank you, Edwin. Th thanks for the question there. Um, right, so we've got a couple of uh, comments that have just uh, come in, um, one from Dave Pitcher, one from Kit Reed, both making the point that Tull was English born in Folkestone, uh, living in the UK, and, and therefore not in the Empire and was therefore not in Britain come as a native. So thanks for those. Um, points there which uh, I think uh, is that is that is that is that fair there Stephen yeah I think so yeah yeah about, about all yeah right okay let me um move on so I've got a question here from Paul so let me just uh Paul yeah. hi Paul no it's um just 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 an observation Stephen I, rather than a question but there were um Indian officers with a viceroy's commission at the time which is separate from the King's Commission, but still a, a commission and paid. And yeah, you know, why was it not explored as an option to get around the uh, you know the, the commissioning issue? Um, because it was that very it was that very differentiation between the Viceroy's commissioned officer and the King's commissioned officer that annoyed the Indians. Yeah. That was the, that was absolutely the point. Is that the colour bar is written into the British military in the way that it wasn't into the legal profession, and it certainly wasn't in the Indian civil service. And um, what annoyed moderate Indians, and it continues throughout the twenties and thirties, is that you've got that two tier system. Okay, no, it should, yeah, just what would have uh, got around this problem of him being paid and being an officer and and so on. But yeah, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks, Paul. thanks for that, Paul. Thanks. Okay, N Nigel can't get the microphone to work, so let's let's uh, read out what, what Nigel's asked here, um, which is: uh, Did he actually get any? Did Malik get any more combat experience just before the end of the war, i.e., when he met Sefton? Um, and um, yeah, that's just. Uh, oh, and he also says. Of Nigel, why didn't he get a knight, knighthood if anyone deserved it? He did. So, uh, thanks for that, <laughs> Nigel. Um, yeah, the, in terms of um, with 11 Squadron, he there's no mention of it in 11 Squadron's um, logs, combat logs, individual pilot officer logs. I, I could see what, what the people who are watching might be interested in is the fact that after the end of the war. Malik was involved with um, gathering German officers in, and their aeroplanes that had surrendered in groups of three and four and transporting them to be decommissioned. So he and a, an observer would take off in a, a Bristol fighter and collect three German aircraft and then return them to a particular base at Nivelle where they would be decommissioned. And he spends two or three months doing that. Thanks for that. Bill asked, do you think that the experiences of the Indians in the Great War in any way set the scene for those Indian pilots who served in the Far East slash Burma in the Second World War? Um, yes, it, it did and it didn't. Um, um, one of the interesting things that came about, and this, there's a Trenchard connection in this, 
is that the Indian Air Force was set up in 1930. But the sad thing about that is that what the Indian Air Force established in India enabled to happen was that, for example, um, those who were into combat over Burma in 1944 and 1945, those pilots were all Indians together. The Indian Air Force was crewed by all Indian people. And what that enabled, um, by separating up an Indian Air Force and a Royal Air Force in India, it kept the Indians separate. So there was no issue about Indians commanding British personnel. They were kept separate. So, for example, you get a Sikh pilot, a Puji, who is a, a combat veteran of the Battle of Britain, and he goes to North Africa, then he goes to Burma, becomes a squadron leader in Burma, but only with the Indian Air Force. And the reason for that is that he cannot be a squadron leader with the Royal Air Force in Burma. And that he's put, he therefore serves with the Indian Air Force with other Indians. It's again, it's a two tier system. It was set up by Trenchard. It's, I'm afraid it's still more of the same um, of that. Okay, thanks for that. Good question. It's a really good question. That. Uh, if anybody has any further questions, please fire them in. But in the meantime, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, ask you, uh, Stephen, if, uh, um, if this is not too, uh, too, too tricky a one, but was he? Um, do you consider that he was a successful, or, or let's rephrase that, a, a good pilot? Um, obviously, uh, uh, some pilots are, are better than others. Also, in terms of perhaps his successors, um, yes, were, were, were other pilot, were other Indian pilots, perhaps I should say, uh, more successful than he was in terms of the combat successes. I won't say kills because that's a Second World War term, isn't it? But, but the, uh, the the shooting down of uh, of German um, um, scouts. Was... Yeah, yeah. The, no, it's a re really good question. Um, it, it's really fascinating. One, I, I often, you know, while I've been researching this book over the last five years, if I go onto websites, uh, particularly of Punjabi heritage in India, I see all sorts of claims that Malik, Malik shot down a dozen, he shot down 15. You know, it just, you don't need to spoil the story. He was a, a really interesting bloke. He, you know, he, he was tested in combat. He made two claims, David. He made two combat claims, one of which was successful. And the other claim, he was furious about it, but he's not alone as a pilot in the Royal Flying Corps making a claim and it's refused. It was a really common, uh, a really common thing. So um, but he, he does many sorties. I forget how many hours he puts in all together, but he's, he's in the air probably all together for four or five months altogether. And uh, the second part of the second answer to the your question is that Indra Ladi Roy was the um, one of those five that were recruited in that window. He shoots down ten Germans. He shoots down five of them on one day in July of wow. 1918. But then he goes. He he's shot down in flames and incinerated over Carnoy uh, two days later. He had a he had a, a terrible concussion, David, and it's. He, he, I think he um, discharged himself from hospital prematurely, should not have been back in a plane after a really nasty accident. And um, yeah, he, um, and he, he came to a very bad end. But um, yeah, he is the Indian ace of the First World War, Indra Ladi Roy. Uh, and there's a, there's a biography there for someone to write, um, I think. <laughs> so if, if five combat victories on one day, that's, yeah. that's going so. Um, it's going so, yeah. yeah, yeah. It tells you a bit about the combat in eighteen as well in July yeah. eighteen. Yeah, that it was uh, intense, absolutely. Yeah. Look, Stephen, uh, thanks very much indeed. That that was absolutely splendid presentation. Thoroughly enjoyed it. About a fascinating character. Uh, obviously, I won't say unique. That's the wrong word, but very unusual uh, gentleman to to be. Uh, um, an officer in the RFC slash RAF, um, and you've shone a light onto a, an under under known subject. So we're very grateful for that. I'm sure everybody's thoroughly enjoyed it um, as well. So if uh, 
if you would like to, as a final, um, I'm getting some nice comments in. Thank you for fascinating talk, brilliant, etc. So these are uh, comments flying in right oh, that's now. That's nice. Thank you to everyone. So a final round of applause, everybody, with the, the, the old hands up routine again. And a, a quick advert for next week's webinar. Um, we're going again next Monday, the Cold Black Sea, um, which is a bit of uh, Winston Churchill bashing. So uh, let's, uh, if, if anybody wants to, to come along to that, uh, please do so. Uh, Stephen, once again, thanks very much indeed. And I think we'll call that a night. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. And thanks to everybody who's taken part. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Thanks very much. Good night. Mademoiselle from